I'd like to ask you to take your Bibles. We're in Galatians chapter 1 and go back to Galatians chapter 1. We're going to pick up in verse 11. Today we're going to be thinking about the messenger of the gospel is reliable. And the reason that is so important and the reason we did not say the message is reliable, it is. But Paul is writing the book of Galatians to a group of people that are jettisoning the gospel. And so he wants them to understand that his ministry has credibility. And the reason he's so insistent on that, because if the credibility of his ministry goes down, then the message he preaches lacks credibility, lacks integrity. Several years ago there was a man that walked into a church to visit the church and he sat about halfway back and as he sat down and as the service progressed and the pastor got up and started preaching, he noticed that the little boy in front of him, seven-year-old boy, was just unhappy. He was squirming and fidgeting and he was whispering and talking and, and uh, it was very uh, disconcerting to the man sitting behind there until the mother leaned over and whispered something into her son's ear. Immediately the boy quieted down and for the rest of the sermon just was good as gold. Well this, this member was curious and so he said after the service to the mother, he said, I'm curious, what did you say to your son that, that settled him down? She says, oh, I just told him, if you don't be quiet, the pastor's going to lose his place in the sermon, going to start all over again. <laughs> and that, that little, now if I see a mother whispering, <laughs> you see, there was a lot of noise and fidgeting going on from the Galatians. And Paul is not whispering in their ears, but he's shouting in their face. Pastor Jeff last week took us through the previous verses that revealed Paul's righteous rage in terms of their abandonment of the true gospel and his, and his passionate plea for them to return, since in reality there is no other gospel except the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul continues this strong warning and admonition by demonstrating what we're going to see to be the reliability of the gospel because of the reliability of the messenger of this gospel. Now the reason Paul is making a point of this is because Paul's ministry, after he left Galatia, his ministry was under attack by a group of Jewish teachers who came out from Jerusalem who were teaching them, look, it's all right to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, that's all well and good, but that's not the whole story. You, you also have to be circumcised. You also have to keep the Sabbath. You also have to do this. You have to do that. And then your, your, your salvation sticks. And we, we have people that still teach that today. And they claim to understand the gospel. They claim to believe the gospel. They claim to preach the gospel. But it is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul is countering their arguments that were ringing in their ears. And even further, these people were saying that Paul made up this message. He just wants to get a following. He wants to get glory for himself. He's one of those people that has a sly hidden agenda. And so that's why he's telling you it's just Christ alone. So Paul is now in verses 11 through verse 24, the end of the chapter, is going to give the Galatians three powerful reasons for the reliability of the gospel he proclaims because the messenger that proclaimed it is reliable. And Paul even says in verse 20, I am not lying. So I want you to follow along with me as we read the text. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 through 24, pay attention to the text. This is the most important thing we'll hear today, not my words, his word. And listen to what he has to say about this most important subject of why the gospel and the messenger that delivered it is so reliable. Paul says, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I didn't receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. 
For you've heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when He who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by His grace was pleased to reveal His Son to me in order that I might preach Him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remain with him fifteen days. It's another name for Peter. But I saw none of the other apostles except James the Lord's brother. In what I'm writing to you before God I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, He who used to perse persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to deliver. And they glorified God because of me. Reason number one. The gospel Paul proclaimed is reliable because it is not man's gospel. Now Paul referred to this. You remember back when he began to talk to them, he began to say to them, look, you need to know that even if an angel told you this, or, or some other man, or even we as men would say this, you have to know that that is not where this gospel came from. The distinction of this gospel is clearly drawn by Paul. This is not good news that originated with man. All other messages of good news that are different than the one Paul has preached are essentially the gospel of man. Paul's making groundless the accusation in verse 10 that he's somehow trying to please men or, or seek man's approval. Paul's gospel gives no credence to men at all. There's nothing in this gospel that would bring credit to man or that, suge that would suggest in any way that man has something that he contributed to this. Human gospels are made up of, of, by men. They're taught by men. They're originated by men. They're received from men. Mormonism, the Jehovah Witnesses, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, they all. And how do you know that they're false gospels? Because Jesus Christ is not front and center in them. And this gospel was received from Jesus Christ and it emphasizes the good news brought by Jesus Christ. Paul says this Christian gospel is totally different. The outworking of this gospel is clearly different too. All the other gospels don't work. We have, we have in our day uh, the gospel of education or the gospel of wealth or the gospel of physical condition. If you want a sense of, um, of how surrounded we are by various kinds of gospels of man, note the items that are marketed in the checkout counter at the store. Did you ever notice these? I, I just recently noticed these. One said you can have perfect abs. Well, I want that. I don't have it. You can be wealthy. Yoga can give you inner peace. I'm just sharing some of the things I read. Take this and your health will be restored. Take this and it will renew your body tone. Take this and it will grow new hair. These are man's gospels. And I will tell you, if you live 110 years of age and you die, all these things failed. Human gospels don't work. Take the gospel of sexual liberation. We're now discovering that it's running its course. Why? Because it's a gospel of man that hasn't worked nor can it work. Why are inner cities facing such great addiction problems? Why is there such an uptick in sexual abuse and sexual disease and sexual redefinition of the, of the sexes? You don't have peaceful hearted people that have engaged in this. You don't have people that are at rest and truly have an inner joy. You have people that are in turmoil, people that live lives of high frustration, people that live on the roller coaster of anxiety continually. These human gospels do not work. 
We're told in the Victorian age they were too strict and prim with their sexual expression. But now, I like the words of one author who said, we have the fire of sexuality let out of the fireplace and running rampant through the house and setting ablaze and burning out and destroying people in our society. Human gospels don't work. Take the gospel of success and preoccupied busyness. We're told that we need to re-educate our kids and get them off the streets and help them have better education about drugs and keep them busy and keep them entertained. And that's the gospel of man. And I'm telling you, it doesn't change the life of our young people. The goal of Memorial Baptist Church in its youth and children's ministries has never been to get the kids off the street. We're not here to make their lives better. We can't do that. We're here to show them Jesus Christ and His gospel that will transform their lives from the inside out. And when the heart is changed, the behavior follows. We think of the Jesus plus gospel, which says Jesus plus the perfect, comfortable, suburban American life is the good news for men. It has failed in prosperous America. We have one of the highest drug addiction rates in the entire world. We're so busy as Christians that we've convinced ourselves this is the way we're to live, and we prove our worth again and again by trying to be satisfied by humans, human men and human women's and, and education and the gospel. When was the last time? And I just wrote this down for my own benefit. When was the last time we had space in our lives to simply believe that God is enough and that His Word will be our source of joy and satisfaction? When do we give this gospel of Christ an opportunity to do its transforming work in our lives? We somehow equate busyness with spirituality. If I am busy, I am more spiritual. I'm telling you, I challenge you to find that in the Word of God. That is a human gospel. Why is that? Because human gospels can't make us do what's right. We need the gospel of Christ for that. You can't negotiate, you can't buy, you can't exercise, you can't meditate, you can't fight or work your way to peace. And the only gospel that promises and delivers peace and acceptance with God is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and Paul says, look, I am proclaiming this gospel as reliable because it is not man's gospel. It is not like man's good news. It doesn't even, re it's not even close. Because you see, the thing you want to hold on to and remember is this. The gospel of Jesus Christ, listen carefully, the gospel of Jesus Christ is supernatural. It is not natural. It doesn't come from our nature. It isn't orchestrated or achieved by the clever inventions or research of men. It's supernatural. When God gets hold of a sinner and he repents of his sin and he puts his trust in Jesus Christ as his Savior, he is wonderfully changed. And that's Paul's next point. Paul says, Reason number two that this gospel and its messenger is reliable is because the gospel Paul proclaimed is not by man's transformation. Paul was changed and transformed by this gospel from being a persecutor of the people of God to be a proclaimer of the message of God. Paul discusses in verse 13 and 14 and verse 23, his past conduct and his character. And the only explanation for the change in this Jewish rabbi's passionate, zealous life for Judaism against the church was the intervention of God with the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. That's the only explanation Paul ever gives. Before the gospel of Christ changed him, 
He was what we would call practicing the religion of I. I've been reading uh, Josh Moody's book, No Other Gospel. Great read. Tremendous read. And he talks in that book about the religion of I. He said, and that's, that's not E-Y-E, it's I, capital I. He said, the religion of I is a way of life. It's a code. It's a series of rules where I can feel good about what I've achieved. It's like a series of boxes on my to-do list that I can check off. Now look at verse 14 and see if you don't see that Paul's former life was a religion of I. Notice how many times in verse 14 he refers to himself as he practices his religion before Christ. And just circled as I read it. I'll try to emphasize it so you don't miss it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age, among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Five times references himself. He had this code, this way of life, this rules he could feel good about. What kind of a thing was he following? When in verse 13 and 14 twice, Paul uses the term Judaism to describe his former lifestyle. And this is the only place in all of Paul's letters where he uses the term Judaism to describe his former lifestyle. Judaism was a term developed by the Maccabees, by the way in response to Jews who were beginning to live more like the Greeks they lived among than like the traditional Jews that their forefathers were. And so that Judaism became sort of a national movement with certain particular criteria that they followed, such as they made sure that everybody did circumcision, everybody did sacrifice, everybody did Sabbath, everybody ticked the boxes off. That was Judaism. Everybody ticked the boxes off. You take the boxes off, you can feel good. You take the boxes off, everything's okay. You take the boxes off, you're going to be good. God's going to accept you. Everything's wonderful. That's how Paul lived. And so he viewed Christianity as a threat to that, and he viewed it aright because Christianity is a threat to that kind of gospel. Christianity doesn't have that kind of gospel. Not at all. Unfortunately, a lot of people view those of us who believe the Bible and teach the Bible who stand for certain moral positions against certain behavior. Unfortunately, many of them do not see us as the people who are proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. They see us as those people that are against everything. That's unfortunate. We've got to work a little harder at that. We want to be known as the people who preach the gospel, who stand for the truth, but we do it in a culture of grace. We've got to be able to do this in a culture of grace because the gospel of Jesus Christ is hemmed in and surrounded by God's grace. God's grace will reach the guy that comes into this door that you don't like. Somebody that comes to your Sunday school class that you're not particularly fond of because of the things they do or say or the things they've said or done. And so all of a sudden you've jettisoned the culture of grace. And I say to you as I would say to myself, shame on you because now you are backing away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. We take our positions because we must to be true to the Word of God, but we better do it. Not because we have a, a code of boxes to check off, but because the grace of God has so gripped us that we are so overwhelmed with how God has saved us. How could we not embrace another sinner who needs Jesus? How can you not do that? In verse 13, the religion of I is also opposed to the church of Jesus Christ. Paul said there, you've heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. Two things come out in Paul's testimony here. Please notice that number one, the life without Christ will tend to push back against the true gospel. And number two, Paul makes it clear that the life without Christ will tend to be all about what's in it for me mentality. See, the true church is not individualistic. It, it's a community that requires commitment. That's why Jesus said people really know that you're following me when you love one another, when you love the difficult 
in your church, when you love the stubborn in your church, when you love the wayward in your church, when you love those who don't even know they're opposing the truth, when you love them. And loving them doesn't mean that you let them do anything they want. There are times when a church has to exercise discipline out of love. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ at work. And Paul said, before I knew the Lord, I violently opposed that way of life. I pushed back against that. He had the religion of I. And I think the religion of I tends to sit back and let it all flow by and, and becomes very competitive. Notice in verse 14 what Paul says. He says, I was advancing, underline these words, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age. Paul was competitive. What's the best and biggest church? Who's the best preacher? Who's the best teacher? Who serves best? Who has the most talent? Who has the best music? We go on this tirade in our smorgasbord approach to Christianity and his church. I'm not saying those things are bad. I'm just saying that's where Paul lived before Christ. I was advancing. This was important to me. I've got to get to the next round. We've got to do this. We've got to be this. This is a zeal without knowledge. It's passionate. But I'm telling you, it's the kind of zeal that blows up buildings and causes wars and fights. Zeal, his zeal was barking up the wrong tree. Look at where this zeal took Paul. It led him... In the, last, in, the, in the next part he says, I, So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. What is that all about? I mean, it leads us to overwrite the Word of God with traditions. We fight for trivialities and we, come, we become passionate over tidbits. Do you know that 95% of the causes of disunity in a church are non-doctrinal and non-theological. I can tell you what they are. They are personality scrapes and relationships. There's somebody wanting their own way and not liking it when something doesn't go their way in the church. You come in, and you find something, well, I don't like that sign somebody put. I don't like the way they're doing that. And instead of a, a loving spirit that spills out of you, you back up and you're the porcupine and you walk along and you bristle and you poke everybody. Not, that's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul was zealous for, for his traditions. When Paul came to Christ. He rejected the religion of I, and he embraced fully the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul was changed and transformed from a persecutor to a proclaimer. Has God changed you like that? Because if, if you still have a lot of that old bristly heart in you, it may be you've never truly been born again. Look at verse 15 and 16. Paul is also transformed, not by man, but by the gospel of Christ from an unbeliever to a believer. Paul explains his conversion here. He says, what I've preached to others, I've experienced myself. This is the true gospel that transforms by grace. Any other gospel is counterfeit. So what marks this gospel is so transforming that you can rely on it. Well, look at what he says in the first part of verse 15. But when he who has set me apart before I was born, look at the first part of verse 16, was pleased to reveal his son in me. Here it is. Here's what makes this gospel so transforming. God did it. Say it with me. God did it. Remember Paul wasn't saved out of a background of drugs and sex and illegal behavior. He was a religious leader with a growing reputation and influence. He was very moral. He was a student of the law. Yet it took God to save him. None of those things saved him. Perhaps like Paul, you, you keep yourself clean through all the challenges of the day. And then when you come home and the kids come towards you, you get grumpy all over. Paul, for a long time, defended as he gave his litany in Philippians 
chapter 3, he said, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He ticked all this stuff off. And then it dawned on him when he came to Christ, his New Testament says, man, these things didn't mean anything. He, sin began to really have a new perspective in his life. That's what happens when the gospel gets a hold of you and changes you. Sort of like the woman who heard the pastor preach on sin after the service, she said to the pastor, Pastor, I want you to know I haven't sinned for 10 years. The pastor looked at her and smiled and said, you must be awfully proud of that. And she said, actually, I am. You see, sometimes we, when, when we're not listening to the gospel of Jesus Christ, we don't see our sin. We don't see ourselves. But, but when Paul saw himself through this transforming power of the gospel, he said, it no longer matters that I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrew. It no longer matters that I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. It doesn't matter that I kept the law and the, and the Sabbath and all these things. For he said, what was gained to me, he said, I counted loss for Christ. What happened to the man? The gospel changed him. It transformed him. God did it. But now look at the next part of verse 15 because Paul is going to say something else about this. He said not only did God do it, but God did it by grace who has who called me, please underline this, who called me by His grace. God called Paul to salvation solely by grace. See, Paul wasn't wandering off to Damascus uh, just on a sort of a whim. He had in mind he was going to kill and persecute Christians when he suddenly made a decision for Christ. That's not really how it happened. He didn't walk down Damascus and say, you know what, I think just for a change of pace, I think I'm, I'm going to buy into that religion. I'm going to I'm going to trust Jesus. Some of you may come to the world and say, I think I'm going to buy into that religion down there at Memorial. Well, let me tell you something. Paul learned the truth of the gospel of Christ not when he decided to believe, but when God revealed it to him. Paul learned the truth of the gospel of Christ because it was God. In fact, if you look at this text carefully, it is all God in this text, and it's all by grace. God set him apart. God called him. God revealed the gospel. God commissioned. Paul, listen carefully, Paul did not plan that day on the road to Damascus to become a believer and an apostle in Jesus, of Jesus Christ. He didn't plan that. He wasn't counting on that. In fact, you know what? I look back to my own salvation as a young boy. I didn't plan on getting saved that Sunday when I got up and got ready and went to church. That wasn't in my plan. Some of you that came to the Lord, in fact, I will say, most of you, in fact, all of us, if we're really honest, didn't really plan on getting saved when we did. God orchestrated my salvation through the teaching of my parents and through a Sunday school teacher named Betty Donaldson. I was seven years old in the class where my father was associate pastor of a church of about 1,200 down in West Virginia, Jefferson Avenue Baptist Church. I was in a class of about 13 other kids. I heard the gospel. My parents had told me. Betty Donaldson talked to us that day about what it meant for a boy to be a sinner what Christ had done, and what Christ wanted from us. And I remember, I didn't plan that morning on getting saved in that class. But God broke through with the gospel. And that's what He does when you get saved. If you're listening, my wife didn't plan on getting saved, but God orchestrated it through her parents and through a radio broadcast one Sunday after. God broke through. And I think some of you came here today, you weren't, the furthest thing from your mind is getting saved, turning from your sins, and trying to trust in Christ as your Savior. But I'll tell you something about the gospel of Christ you need to know. God breaks through in the gospel. He'll get hold of you. Now you can run, you can try to hide, but God knows how to get through. God is inviting you on His terms, not yours. He has the power to save you, and He'll do it apart from any effort of your own. Because that's what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. God did it. God did it by grace. That we're not done. Look at the next part of verse 16. Paul said, He was pleased to reveal His Son to me. 
Underline those words, His Son. God did it through Christ. God doesn't do it through any other means. He does it through Christ. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, Paul makes it clear that he had plenty to boast about when he was an unbeliever. He had this religion, this self-righteousness, but he didn't have Christ. But when Paul came to Christ, his confession is, look at Galatians, just go over two chapters to chapter 6. We'll get there someday. Chapter 6, verse 14, look at what Paul said. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go back to chapter 2 of Galatians. Look at verse 20. You, many of you have memorized this. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. God did it. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. God did it by grace. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. God did it through Christ. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And any other teaching that takes any of those things out is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's one more reason. It's in the last part of verse 16 and verse 24, and that is this. The gospel proclaimed by Paul is reliable because it is not for man's glory. It is not for man's glory. Paul said in verse 16, all this happened. I came to Jesus, called by God, in order that I might preach Him among the Gentiles. Verse 24, and they glorified God because of me. So here it is, it was for the sake of others, Paul says, that, that God saved him and he became a messenger of the gospel. And Paul never, Paul understood that from the get-go. It wasn't about him. He never had a personal agenda. And that's what so stirred Paul's writing here and his defense of the gospel because the Judaizing people that came out of Jerusalem said Paul had a hidden agenda. You think Paul had a hidden agenda? Then listen to Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 1, 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to cre preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent, eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Paul said, I, I didn't come trying to impress people with my speech. I didn't come to count numbers as how many I could baptize and how many I could get in. And Paul said, I didn't, that wasn't my agenda. Look at chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians, verses 1 through 5. Listen to Paul's words. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom. Does that sound to you like a man with an agenda? Who wants to get glory to himself? No, he went on to say, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Oh, and I've got to read 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 through 8. Such powerful words in Paul's testimony. He erases forever the, the notion that Paul had a hidden agenda, that somehow he was doing it for his own glory or man's glory. Listen to this. Paul said to the Thessalonian Christians, for our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you have become very dear to us. And when I read that, I back up and I say amen because the messenger of the gospel like that is reliable. God saved Paul, called him to win others. When God puts a man in ministry of the pastorate or the youth pastorate or missions or any other kind of ministry, it is never with a view to produce pride in him or selfishness or his own personal agenda. I like what the old preacher John Berridge said. I love his words. 
the foulest stain and the worst absurdity in our nature is pride. And yet this vile hedgehog so rolls himself up in his bristly coat that we can seldom get a sight of his claws. Pride cleaves to us like a shirt soaked in tar cleaves to the skin. No sharp plowing and harrowing will clear the ground of it. This foul weed will be sure to spring up with the next rain. Pride follows me like my shadow. It has such an amazing appetite that it can feed both on grace and garbage. And I look at Paul. I look at his preaching about the gospel he proclaimed, and I find absolutely nothing in that that brings glory to man. In fact, just the opposite. First Corinthians chapter 15, Paul said, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And you think about the perception they were painting of Paul as a prejudiced Jewish rabbi. If, that, if he was a prejudiced Jewish rabbi and preaching this gospel of grace, he would have never decided himself to minister to the despised Gentiles. I mean, their argument breaks down just out of simple logic. If you want to build a reputation, you don't go to the Gentiles to do it as a Jewish rabbi. That's exactly what he did. Because the gospel in Paul's life and in ours never elevates us, and that leads us to the understanding that it is for the glory of God. Paul says, the people he ministered to glorified God because of him in verse 24. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, he warned the Ephesians, or the Corinthians, when he said, Each one of you says, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, I follow Christ. And Paul says, Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Come on. In chapter 3, he said, I planted, Apollos watered. But God gave the growth, so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. You need to understand something. God uses vessels. But I'm telling you something. It isn't a vessel that produces the fruit. If your wife gives you a tall glass of iced tea with ice in it, and man, it's made just like you love it. Or somebody fix, fixes, this would be a challenge, fix Nate Bell a cup of coffee like he had never had in his life. It was the best he ever tasted. I guarantee you he's going to look at the cup and say, man, what a cup. What a cup. No, it's what's in the cup, right? It's, it's what's in the cup. Remember what Paul said in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7? We have this treasures in jars of clay. That the surpassing power may be seen to belong to God and not to us. So if God blesses you in the children's ministry, thank God He did it. Because I'm telling you, if you did it, it wouldn't happen. Because every time you and I get to messing with it, we mess it up. We've got to remember this comes from God. And what a joy. Could that be said of us? Is there a gospel joy in us, this gospel conviction that we serve for God's glory, not as a way of making us happy or satisfied or prominent or successful in our circle or to give us a sense of accomplishment? The sheer joy comes from understanding what the gospel of God through Christ has done for us and what it can do for others. Jared Wilson in his book Gospel Deep, since I'm reading this great little book, said this, if steak or coffee or chocolate or anything else other than God is the highlight of my day or the ultimate joy of my heart, then my joy, and I might add the prospect of God receiving glory from my life and ministry, then my joy is temporary, hollow, thin. But if I believe in the gospel, I can finally enjoy the chocolateness of chocolate and the coffeeness of coffee. Only the gospel frees me to enjoy things as they truly now are and as someday they will be. That's how powerfully transforming the gospel is. Because it is not from man and it brings glory to God. So the whole argument of Paul comes down to a matter of authority. 
the case of the Galatians, they were presented with the authority from these people that came out from Jerusalem, or the authority that the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached by Paul brought to them. They had to make a decision. That's why Paul closes the chapter like he does in the last part of verse 16, clear down through verse 23. He makes two simple points. He said, look, he said, you need to understand the gospel I preach is not in conflict with those of Jerusalem apostles. We're, che- we're preaching the same gospel. The thing you've been hearing is not the gospel that the apostles in, in Jerusalem are preaching. Number two, he says, you need to know that this gospel has the authority, not the church, Not even if he and Peter were to go off track, they must not be followed because the gospel of Jesus Christ itself is the authority. Today we have people writing books about the secret message of Jesus or the lost books of the Bible or the the lost message of Jesus. You see books like that uh, at borders or when you're checking out. Just don't even go there. That's a bunch of trash. Paul says... Verse 20, I'm not lying. Listen to the Scripture. Now here's some, I'm going to close with these implications. I want you to get these. Number one, listen carefully. This is very important. I say a lot of things in this pulpit as your pastor, but this is extremely important for you to get and understand. Board members, staff members, you need to get this. This is important. The church has no right or authority to change the gospel in any way. We have no right, we have no authority to change the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church is not the author of the gospel. The church is not the originator of the gospel. The church is invested with the responsibility of proclaiming the gospel that God gave through the apostles and through Jesus Christ and as recorded in this book. And if you end up going to a church that does not preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, I hope you would have the courage. I don't care how much you love those people. I don't care how much you love the things they do or the building they're in or the music they have. I would hope that you would have the guts and the conviction to get up and walk out and dust off your feet and say, I'm never going back there because they have prostituted the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church has no right or authority to change the gospel. Number two, the church is to praise God for this gospel. Not praise men, praise God. When when Pastor Jeff or I or or Bill Tobias or Nate or another missionary preaches from this pulpit and they preach the truth of Jesus Christ, I would hope that you wouldn't praise us, you would praise God for that gospel, for that message. Because it's from Him. Number three, We who are the church, if we say we believe the gospel, better proclaim this gospel as the powerful truth it is. We proclaim this gospel. We proclaim it in truth. We proclaim proclaim it powerfully. We proclaim it unapologetically. We proclaim it uncompromisingly. We will not give an inch on this, but we will proclaim it in a culture of grace. So that no matter how far off people may be from the good news, they will see an open door of hope that even they could come. Even they could come. And number four, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me say carefully, you must believe this gospel if you will ever be accepted by God and saved and have a home in heaven. You must believe this gospel. The gospel is simply this. Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Your salvation doesn't lie in a creed, in a church, in works or moral behavior. It lies in the person of Jesus Christ. When you realize you're a sinner and Christ died for your sins and and God will accept you only in Christ and you repent of those sins and by faith you put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, The Bible says He will save you from your sins. You must believe this gospel. There are not not three gospels. There are not four. There are not five. There are not the Baptist gospel. There's not the Presbyterian gospel. There's There's one gospel. Now, a lot of churches don't proclaim it. There are some Baptist churches that don't proclaim it. Shame on them. But we better. 
because we have no other message to give to a world in trouble that will give them hope and acceptance apart from this gospel. You see, our theme this year is Christ above all, better than all. Now you see why we're in the book of Galatians. There's just nothing that trumps the gospel of Jesus Christ. And once you are saved, you're not done with the gospel. Because now we're invested with the wonderful privilege and the awesome responsibility of living that gospel out in its entirety in our world. Because daily, as the Spirit of God works in my life, because of that gospel, He is working to make me more into the likeness of Christ. That's gospel work. That's what Jesus came to do. He didn't come to improve my life. I told you a couple of weeks ago, Jesus didn't come to improve us. He came to change us, to transform us, to redeem us, so that we might be His instruments to tell others there is a way out, and it is through Jesus Christ. Lord, this morning our ears are bombarded, our minds, Lord, are infected at times. Our lives are surrounded by man's gospel. We're told all kinds of things that can change our lives and make a difference and give us a better life. But Lord, when the dust settles and we're standing by a coffin, we realize how empty all those man's gospels really are. And then, Lord, we're back to the cross. We're back to the realization that there's something fundamentally and desperately wrong in our souls that we can't fix. No invention of man has ever been able to fix it. The best medicines, the best philosophies, the greatest show of compassion, the victories, all these things still leave us trapped, enslaved, in bondage to our sin. And the further we walk down this road, the more sin begins to take its toll on us as a reminder that in the end, humanly speaking, it will win. The wages of sin is death. Oh, thank you for the rest of that verse, Lord. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, Spirit of God, please open eyes of people today who have joined us who do not know Jesus, who aren't aware perhaps of the great danger they are in. Oh, may your Spirit just strip the blindness away and let them see and sense the good news in Jesus Christ. And for those of us who are saved, oh God, clean our backyards up, clean our souls up, clean our emotions up. Help us, Lord, to show the grace of this gospel to one another and the grace of this gospel to people that come through our doors. They've got to see it operating in us or they'll want no part of it. Lord, kill the hypocrisy in us and let us live with only one agenda, the agenda that Paul had for his life. When he said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And he punctuated it, Lord, by telling us that he would proclaim nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Let us be known for people of great grace because we are people committed to our mission of inviting people to know and follow Christ. With our heads bowed, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, don't run and hide. Don't take shelter in the fact, well, God knows I'm weak, or God knows I wasn't raised that way, or 
God, no, no, those are just excuses the enemy would love for you to sit down on and camp and take comfort in. I don't want you to take comfort in this because that's dangerous. You'll miss the good news. You'll miss Christ. After the service, we're going to have counselors available. It is my prayer that if God is break, trying to break through to you and you're sensing, you know what? I know this is for me. I know this is where I'm at. Then God is trying to break through to you. Have the courage afterwards just to stay a few minutes and let someone pray with you and go over the good news so that, so that you clearly understand and trust your Christ as your Savior. And for those of us who are saved, I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know how you, you're treating the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe you thought, well, I, I, was, I thought I was done that I was saved 20 years ago. It's not for me. Oh, but it is. And it might be that you've been one of those porcupines. You're going to have to go humble yourself and say, boy, you know what? I haven't, I haven't contributed to a culture of grace in this church, and that's what the gospel is all about. It doesn't mean we tolerate sin, not at all, but we certainly embrace sinners. And even we make mistakes with one another. When Paul got saved, the religion of I disappeared from his life. No wonder he could say, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That should be our mantra as well. Lord Jesus, may the Spirit of God so work today that you would be pleased to grant a stirring, a fresh stirring of the Spirit of God in our church that the enemy cannot shut down, that people will be saved, that Young believers will grow. The people that visit us will sense this culture of grace among us. Where, where one writer said, where the sermon begins in the parking lot, not behind the pulpit. Help us, Lord, to be those kind of people. That, like, that unlike the Galatians, will not turn neither in precept or practice, to another gospel, which is not another at all. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the true gospel. It's in your name we pray. Amen.